Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show and welcome to another edition of Forensics Talks. Today is going to be episode 30, so we made it to episode 30. Um, I want to first off say thank you to everyone who attended our Click 3D course uh, Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you and um, we have another course that is going to be coming up. And that's going to be on uh, May 4th and 5th. So that's going to be the cloud compare course. So if you're interested in processing uh, meshes or 3D point clouds and things like that, uh, cloud compare is an open source software package and it's super, super useful. Um, all you have to do is head over to the website, ai 2 uh, d.com And if you go into the training section, uh, you'll see it there. Otherwise, just do slash cloud compare course and you will be able to find it. Also, the Canadian Society of Forensic Science is going to be having their annual conference on June 21st to 24th. And I'm really excited about it. I am one of the organizers. And so um, we have a really great lineup of speakers, uh, plenary sessions. Um, we've got uh, networking capabilities, poster sessions for students. There's going to be a lot going on uh, that week. So just head over to uh, csfs.ca if you're interested. Um, it's very, very reasonably priced for the amount of um, uh, talks and presentations and activities that we have planned. So uh, please have a look there. I think that'll be really interesting. Um, the other thing too is I'd like to uh, just mention that uh, there is an online survey. It's a, it's a BPA pattern classification study that is somewhat related to what we're doing here today. And it has to do with uh, establishing the differences between wipes and swipes. And if you uh, head over uh, to, I have to give you this uh, link. And what I'll do is uh, I'll copy this and just put this into the uh, comments or to the chat window so that that shows up and uh, people can link to it if they want. Um, but if uh, you're interested, uh, you do a search for Gareth Griffiths over here. And uh, if you can see that, I'm not sure, but let me go there. So Gareth Griffiths, uh, he's one of the researchers that's conducting this study. And again, if you're interested, please go ahead and uh, have a look there. Okay, great. So let me remove that. I think we're good there. And let's begin with uh, today's uh, talk. So um, you, you may have been hearing a lot about artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning and all kinds of different things uh, in the media, online and everything. So it's kind of a hot topic. And when doing some research on AI, um, there are a few applications inside of forensics. And most of them, though, have to do with for example, data, uh, digital forensics, and things like that. And so our guest today is going to be talking to us about how AI has applications in different areas. So for example, looking at things like age and sex assessment or applying it to other areas, uh, maybe that could really benefit. So um, the guest is Etienne Pilin. He holds a PhD in mathematics from the University of Leicester in the UK, as well as uh, uh, Master of Science degrees in financial mathematics, mathematical modeling, statistic, uh, st statistical physics uh, from Paris Dauphin University and Pierre Marie Curie Universities. His uh, doctoral research was funded by the European Commission as part of the Intrepid Forensics Program. And this is where a number of different PhD students from different disciplines uh, you know, got together and did a whole bunch of different things in forensic science. Um, his specific research topic pertained to machine learning applied to fingerprint, uh, fingerprint identification, and his thesis was entitled A Systematic Approach to fingerprint, uh, fingerprint Identification via Source Probabilities. In 2018, he founded a startup company called Clotho AI, and uh, he's developing some cutting edge decision making and support software uh, to improve the robustness of forensic assessments. And he's looking at human and algorithm, algorithmic assessments through online proficiency testing tools and automatic evidence assessment algorithms. So on that note, I wanna welcome in. Hey, Etienne, how you doing? I'm good, thanks, how are you, Eugene? Uh, great, so th thank you very much for taking the time today. Um, I've got a heck of a lot of questions because uh, if, you, if you're online and, and you're doing, um, you know, searches on AI, you get a lot of different, a lot of different things because it applies to so many different things. And if you try to do a search for AI and as it applies to things like, um, uh, you know, footwear impressions or uh, bloodstain pattern analysis, there's very, very limited uh, amount of research out there and, and even application. So let me ask you first, um, how did you get started in all of this? 
Well, um, well, as you mentioned, most of my background is really in mathematics and physics. And uh, back in 2014, I had very little exposure to forensic science other than CSI, like most people. And it was really as part of my PhD that I started getting exposure to forensic science and the possibilities of, say, machine learning and other mathematical tools to the different kinds of forensic assessments uh, that are relevant to the police. So it's really through this that I gained uh, exposure through that, through my interactions with other forensic scientists and also to various police forces. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, now, were you always were you always interested in mathematics, and you were sort of a uh, that that kind of a person? I don't know too many mathematicians. And in fact, we met uh, we met what like five years ago or four? I can't remember. It's, uh, it was several years ago. You probably remember better than I do. But five years ago in two thousand sixteen at right. uh, Forensic Science Day at UTM, yeah. At, that's right, University of Toronto Mississauga, their Forensic Science Day. Correct. So yeah, and I, me I remember discussing a lot of these three D topics, and you were already looking at them and how they can be applied. So I definitely want to ask you about. Uh, some of those things, but but mathematics was your thing. Uh, was just something you were always interested in, or did you? Kind yeah, of always that? interested in that. Yeah, <laughs> interested also in physics to some other degree, uh, but um, yeah, it was really mathematics that was amazing. And uh, okay. yeah, cool. And so, um, what can you, like uh, your company now, Clodo AI? Um, you're looking at uh, things like uh, applying these AI algorithms or AI to solving problems in forensics. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. So again, this is something I started working on just on, on the specific problem of fingerprint identification as part of my thesis. But through my different interactions, I realized that um, you know there are many possibilities for again mathematical tools, machine learning being just one of them. And I mean, obviously, there's some debate as whether this, this is mathematics or computer science. But the point is, that say rigorous science applied to different uh, forensic assessments. Um, yeah, so there's definitely possibilities for other mathematical tools, for instance, like the resolution of partial derivative equations. I think that that is definitely something that uh, can be applied to some fields of uh, forensic science. But machine learning is definitely another big one since it pertains so much to, since it can it can be here to complement human expertise. So I would say that uh, this is really within the field of, let's say, um, human-made decisions. This is really where I think that machine learning can make a big difference in forensic science. Okay. And of course, so, we know how prevalent they are. So this is why it's so relevant. Okay. So when we talk about machine learning, it is, I mean, there's, there's the way I, I picture it or the way I've, I've kind of seen it is there's artificial intelligence and then machine learning kind of falls underneath artificial intelligence. Is that fair to say, or is it sort of, how do you, how do you sort of position it in on the pyramid uh, so of AI? This is up to interpretation. My view on this is that uh, machine uh, artificial intelligence is really the layman's word for uh, machine learning. I see. So the actual discipline, mostly coming out of computer science, would call machine learning, and also also refers to basically, uh, let's say, a class of algorithms that can learn from data. This is how I would like summarize it. Again, it okay. can be different opinions, but that's the gist of it. So the goal. So when we talk about the 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 purpose or the goal of machine learning or AI, would it be fair to say that it has more, it has to do with having the, um, having, I'll call it the system or whatever it is, the computer or the system or the algorithm, uh, making, is it also, it's making its own decisions, right? Is that one part of it? Well, making a decision is one of the problems that you can solve, but, uh, the general part of it that I guess, um, I guess unites all these algorithms is that they, is that they learn from data. Meaning that rather than uh, rather than the the person programming the algorithm uh, using the the theoretical knowledge of a problem and basically computing uh, let's say a heuristic solution to the problem to an algorithm, the idea is that we do not necessarily want to add our theoretical knowledge of the problem in it, and instead we're going to try and infer infer basically things, rules, information, or a decision making process from data again. Every, uh, okay. The point is that it comes from data, and that's the okay. strength of these algorithms. Okay, and and then, you know, obviously, when it, it's able to do these um, decisions, like it, it's it's one thing for me to imagine you have a, a series of problems or inputs, and then you make a decision. But it also uh, should, in some cases, you want it to operate independently. Does that make sense? Like it should should you want to remove the human element in some cases? Oh, just to be clear, within these algorithms, there's, I mean. There's, there can be a human element involved, for instance, in the, uh, in the input data that is given to the algorithms. So <clears throat> thinking of, in, in, of these algorithms in terms of their input and output is a very good way, I guess, to approach the, uh, the problem. So again, there are some categories of algorithms that don't really fall into, these, uh, into this paradigm. 
Um, um, but I guess this is a good way to at least get started. We can, you know, implement upon, uh, upon this if you're interested in, on, on, in uh, reinforcement learning, for instance, that we're not completely formed within this. But at least if we if we think in terms of input and output, there can be a human element in that, um, for instance, the, the, the assessment of a human can potentially be used as training data for these algorithms. Okay. So I can explain, explain upon this, whether you, depending on whether you want to talk about like the training data or the different paradigms that exist within machine learning and so on. Well, you, you, you said, uh, so for example, you, you mentioned um, reinforced learning. So there, yeah. there's a few things that, and again, there's a lot here. So uh, maybe we'll start easy. Um, yeah. Uh, reinforced learning, and then there's uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So let's let's start with those three. The, the difference between supervised, unsupervised, and reinforced learning. Yeah, that, that's a good way to at least uh, start understanding the problem, trying to categorize it, and then seeing what is it that can be useful to us, not knowing that there's there's a lot of different tools that that can be useful in forensic science. So yes, we can categorize it this way in between supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Um, supervised learning would be uh, basically the fact that we, we have algorithms that learn from labeled data. So that's the way it's, used in, uh, it's named in computer science. The idea is that data would be, for instance, the say the input data on which the assessment is made. So taking the example of fingerprint identification, that would be just the, let's say, image files of uh, either finger impressions or even li live scan acquired uh, fingerprints. For instance, and the, the fact that it's labeled just refers to the fact that there's uh, data associated to it that is relevant regarding the assessment that we expect the algorithm to make. So, for instance, again, if we're interested in fingerprint identification, these labels can, can correspond to uh, the source of each of these uh, uh, each, each of these uh, fingerprints, right? So, in that context, uh, supervised learning would correspond would, uh, would would refer to these algorithms that learn from labeled data, meaning. Uh, just fingerprints with the associated information, whether it is uh, source, whether it is uh, minutia, for instance, if we're interested in, in assessing the minutia within a finger, in a finger mark. That's one first thing. The, the second paradigm would be unsupervised learning. And the purpose of this is that they learn from unlabeled data, meaning just the images of those fingerprints, for instance. And we can be interested in a different number of tasks, for instance, let's say classifying or clustering them, meaning identifying groups of fingerprints or figure marks that make sense. Um, this is vastly different from the first one, uh, of the first paradigm, because in, in supervised learning, we know the uh, expected assessment from the algorithm, and therefore we train it to reproduce that assessment, uh, not only in the case of the, the training set, but also on the evaluation data set, meaning fingerprints or finger marks to which it has not been exposed. If that makes sense. Okay. In unsupervised learning, on the other hand, we don't necessarily know how it, well, the, the information, like the, the, the rationale the algorithm is going to follow in order to, for instance, cluster these, uh, uh, these uh, groups of finger marks is not being given as part of the data. Instead, it's implemented as part of the rationale of the algorithm. So you're a lot more uncertain as, as to where, what else assessment you're, you're going to get. And um, so one relevant research that I've heard of uh, with regards to forensic science would be, uh, for instance, the, uh, the clustering of um, individuals based on their um, uh, on the skeletal remains. So I'm not sure exactly which uh, bone it was, but the point was to basically come up with some grouping or clustering that made sense from an ancestral background perspective. But the idea being that you do not uh, give the algorithm the your, your own opinion about the classification, but instead you let it come with its own interpretation. And that can, that can have a lot of value in order to potentially uh, put yourself back in question, put the theory back in question as to how you classify something. And in the case for skeletal remains, that's very relevant um, for reasons that I want to elaborate on, mm -hmm. but um, you know, is it you know, what's going to play a more of a role within in the appearance of a bone? Is it going to be, you know, how do we classify things? Do some uh, ancestral backgrounds make sense, or, is this, or is, does this have more of a, a cultural influence? Basically, this was the purpose of this research. Okay. And if you allow me, just for reinforced learning, uh, reinforcement learning. Sorry. So the purpose is a bit different, and this is more so applied to, let's say, uh, I guess, multi-agent learning or decision making over time. The idea is that uh, I think of the algorithm as an agent who needs to make decisions over time. And for instance, this this is, I believe, the type of algorithm that was used 
uh, by Google in order to, um, to program AlphaGo. So this was um, a machine learning program that basically uh, beat uh, the, one of the uh, top champions in Go back in 2016, I believe. Um, so more, more so with that notion of decision-making over time and giving, given a state of information. So I guess that can potentially have a, an impact on forensic science, but I'm, I'm less sure of that. So when you when you so just so I'm clear, so when you say like the reinforced learning, that's so the user has some input. So for example, you're, you're trying to steer the system to go one way or the other, or it just uh, trying to give it and trying to steer it to the end goal. Is is that kind of a way to look at it? Let's not think about like um, human input yet. Just <laughs> to make things simple, uh, let's just say that reinforcement learning refers to that category of algorithms that are going to make a decision depending on the state. Uh, on, this, on a given state of information. So for instance, in the game of Go, it could be uh, the, the current board and the, the previous states of the board. What are the previous moves that have been made? Does that make sense? Okay, so yeah, the, okay. The, there's added complexity of the fact that uh, time, you know, uh, you know, there, there's a notion of time as well. And I guess that can also be very relevant for self-driving uh, self cars and these sorts of algorithms. I'm not very familiar with the type of research, but I would say that reinforcement learning is perfectly uh, adapted to this. So what about when people talk about statistical learning? Is that just, is, does that, are all of those statistical learning techniques or, or is that a different branch of learning? That's a very relevant question. So just like many other fields, I guess machine learning can be considered to be multidisciplinary. There are several routes to it. And one of it is in statistical learning. So everything pertaining to statistical decision theory, well, at least that's, um, uh, gave birth to at least some ideas in forensic in a, sorry, a machine learning. Others come from computer science, or they come from information theory, which I guess has overlaps with that, uh, with statistics. Um, but I guess it's just one of the you know um, academic initial branch for uh, for the field. Okay. So that's why I was looking at it. But it is, I wouldn't say that it is necessarily very related to statistics in general. Um, I feel like in forensic science, many people think of statistics in, in terms of uh, statistical tests, you know, and, and these sorts of things. And I wouldn't say that uh, statistical tests are relevant or even um, uh, PCA, for instance. I would say that uh, machine learning is fairly different from that. Okay. There's a lot of terms. So I, 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 <laughs> a lot of terms. I'm trying you, to keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's a pyramid of stuff here. So, for example, the other one is that you hear a lot of is deep learning. So yes. now what, when they're talking about deep learning, what, what are they referring to? Yeah. So I would say deep learning is a field, is a, let's say a subfield within uh, machine learning. So again, that's probably the basis of when, when it actually started, but it was probably around like, the earliest 2005. Um, and the premise of machine learning is based upon, again, like simpler concepts within, uh, sorry, deep learning is based upon simpler concepts within machine learning and which are artificial neural, ne sorry, artificial neural networks or ANNs. Um, so, first of all, regarding neural networks, so those are basically concepts that we've known pretty much since the 80s, I believe. This is initially when the, where the first uh, examples of neural networks uh, were invented. And the idea is that um, they were basically mimicked on, or on the general premise and general way in which neural networks uh, work in living beings. On the way they take uh, input and output, basically. And, um, just to present it like in the simplest uh, way, for those who have a mathematical background, I would say that a neural network, or at least a layer of neuron, just basically is a matrix multiplication. So the idea is that it's an operation which transforms an input into an output, and there's information regarding the weights of the, of the neural network that correspond to just the indices of that matrix. So what's important to know, and this is a foundation part of many of deep learning, is that you have weights, meaning parameters of your algorithms, that are going to define how you transform your input into your output. Okay. okay. So that's the premise of basic premise of neural networks and uh, and uh, yeah, neural networks. And uh, deep learning, the premise of deep learning is that you can basically add several layers of these, let's say, simple tasks, in order to make a, a more complex algorithm. So the drive for these things, like the, the, the more we can make, like the, the more we can, the more parameters we have, and the more complex of a function basically we can create, um, the more it means that we're likely to be able to find uh, a solution, an algorithm that can transform the input that we have into the output we want. What matters is that there's a solution out there, 
right? So there's a combination of parameters that will give us the uh, the answer that we want. And it's a matter of basically training the algorithm, which can be seen um, as, say, calibrating your model, mm -hmm. and which corresponds to finding a good com combination of parameters that are going to give you the a good algorithm, meaning one that makes an assessment that gives you the output that you want in the majority of cases. Okay. Does that make sense? So deep learning is basically the fact that we have several, many layers of neurons, if that makes okay. sense. Um, why do you think it is that uh, a lot of the a lot of the work that's being currently done with um, AI or deep learning in forensics has more to do with, for example, cell phone data or computer forensics and things like that, as opposed to um, bloodstain pattern analysis or or uh, you're talking about an ancestry and, and age assessment in anthropology. Uh, why do you think that there might be a uh, uh, a disparity there? Well, um, very relevant question. I think there's perhaps two component, two, two main reasons for that. Let's say a theoretical one and a say cultural one. So the theoretical one, in, in just to draw a parallel with what I just said, is that um, the deep learning has showed a lot of prom like a lot of great promise, especially within supervised learning. And this is, I think it was initially in 2008, 2000, perhaps actually more so 2012, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, we started getting really, really, um, um, really uh, good, um, basically unsupervised learning algorithms. For instance, we're with regards to uh, pattern recognition and uh, recognizing letters and so on. So it's really that branch of uh, machine learning that, among other things, but initially that bears great promise. And these algorithms learn from data, meaning that the primary prerequisite that you have in order to, to get good results is a lot of data. And just again, to draw a parallel with what I said regarding the number of parameters, the idea is that the more parameter you have, the more data you need in order to, to make an accurate, to, 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 to come up with a good uh, calibration, to come up with a good training procedure. So there's a limitation with regards to what fields uh, uh, machine learning can be applied to. You need to have a substantial amount of data and you need good quality data, meaning that for supervised learning, you need the data to be labeled, meaning to have the answer to your solutions. To okay. your, right. And yeah. so, and so in, in basically in environments, for instance, such as uh, digital forensics, where, where the data originates from, uh, from uh, computer systems, you naturally already have an organic way in which data is provided to you. Whereas this is not necessarily the case uh, for, let's say, conventional uh, forensic disciplines, and especially more niche ones, uh, where, which mainly reside on human expertise. In my, from my perspective, at least that's, that's okay. one main justification. And I guess the second justification would be that that would be more of a cultural one. Um, people working within, I guess, uh, digital forensics would have more of a computer science background. And so they're more naturally exposed to machine learning. They can uh, pick up necessary tools in order to, uh, to, to, to create these algorithms, basically. And that's, I think, much less the case in conventional Yeah, that, that, that kind of makes sense. Um, in terms of the, like you mentioned a couple of things. So there are things that obviously computers do well, which may be considered sources of data. And so, for example, um, uh, language, sound. So computers can analyze sound. And actually, a, a couple of weeks ago, I had um, someone here who was a forensic scientist uh, looking at you know statistical models, and they did a lot of research with uh, forensic voice comparison. And um, I thought that was kind of kind of interesting. But what about other areas, like other sources uh, that a computer can pick up from? Yeah. So machine learning algorithms can be applied to different types of data. I would say that the most prevalent type of data has been images. This is what's uh, received, uh, I guess, the, the biggest amount of attention. This is also uh, where machine learning, to my knowledge, again, uh, has uh, has proved uh, to have excellent results. And um, many algorithms, for instance, I'm thinking of uh, convolution, convolutional neural networks, they're particularly well suited to deal with image-based problems. So any any field of forensic science where you where there's human expertise put into uh, images, I would say regardless of the assessment almost, um, this can be useful. So again, I mentioned fingerprint identification, that's definitely the case for uh, fingerprint assessments in general, um, but also uh, BPA, so for bloodstain pattern analysis, that can be definitely relevant in order to, for instance, assess the, the, the shapes of the, the different bloodstains present uh, within a photograph, um, just to quote a few. Um, I would say that we can definitely we can definitely delve deeper into that. I mean, this I would say that perhaps we can talk about, for instance, different types of tasks that uh, 
that uh, algorithms can perform. You know, there's the, the problem of classification, segmentation. Yeah, please. That, that's um, that's definitely my next question. Yeah, I wanted to yeah. know what what it can do with this type of data. Yes. Well, again, the, there are, there are established tasks on which we already know that there's basically neural networks that are, let's say, almost ready made, and they can do a good job. So I'm th I'm thinking, for instance, like a canonical example is CNNs, convolutional neural networks on images that can be used for for instance, classifications, meaning um, establishing basically patterns or sorry, groups within your data. So taking the example of fingerprint identification again, uh, determining whether, let's say, groups of different finger marks come from one given source, for instance, or whether they fall they, they within one given type of category. So for instance, within one given type of level one detail, this can be formalized as a, as a, as a classification problem. There's also segmentation, uh, which is for instance, in the case of uh, image recognition, would be identifying different uh, different parts, basically, with an image uh, that correspond to different things. So, for instance, in BPA, that could be used in order to differentiate the different blood stains from the background, for instance. Um, again, like this is just within the, uh, just two canonical examples within like image recognition. Um, but um, one particular research, for instance, that I've been involved in was uh, applying machine learning to uh, point cloud data. So right now, this is made possible because, again, this theoretical knowledge regarding uh, neural networks, especially deep learning, uh, that can take in as input uh, point cloud data and they can do a good job for reasons that I can elaborate on. But uh, the idea is that they can take such input, such a data as input and potentially perform the same tasks. So again, like classification that would be assessing whether point cloud data falls within one category one other, and also segmentation, identifying, let's say, points, like groups within a point cloud uh, that can, you can label one way or another. Okay. And um, so to talk con concretely, let's speak more concretely, uh, um, for instance, like the, one of the research I was involved in um, basically was uh, pertained to uh, basically skeletal uh, human remains classification. And so we use an existing algorithm, PointNet, which was developed in, uh, I believe, 2016, 2017. Uh, to point cloud data of uh, skeletal remains in order to assess um, ancestry, uh, age classes, and so on. And okay, um, interesting. it was very successful. Well, let me, can I ask you about the research that you did for your PhD? Because yes. was that was that the sort of the first uh, major project you had that involved machine learning? Yes, um, I'm taking, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I took a very, let's say, unconventional approach to the problem here. Um, basically, Although I've been talking about all the potential upside or what, uh, what machine learning can do, I think they're also just like any tool, uh, there are limitations associated to this tool. And uh, you know, since my background, well, my PhD was in mathematics, I basically have to question and come up with theoretical, uh, the theoretical reasoning as to, as to what machine learning can do in uh, forensic assessments. And um, one particular problem which, uh, which I see or which I see could happen if we uh, if we apply machine learning to forensic assessments, is the fact that they may not necessarily meet the requirements of forensic science. So obviously, when we think about these requirements, we think of the Dalbert standard, um, but we really need to think about the final output of these algorithms. Forensic science is really to the service of the court and not just science itself, right? And mm -hmm. so and a potential output or an outcome of the problem that can be uh, satisfactory from a scientific perspective may not be suitable for the court. Namely, we know that we need the, the algorithms to be as explainable as possible, as justifiable as possible, and you know, ideally also like, as, um, let's say, free from bias, if there's such a thing. So basically, my PhD was that kind of devoted to that. How is it that we? What are the uh, the current limitations of machine learning algorithms? Is deep learning, for instance, completely suitable out of the box for identification algorithms uh, directly admissible in court? And um, and what would be necessary? What would be a different framework to uh, try and uh, and come up with court admissible algorithms? Okay. Now, did you have to collect all the data yourself on this one, or did you have access to a database, no. an existing database? No, I did not have access to. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah. the main problem that I faced during my uh, during my thesis, and this is why I'm trying to address this part of uh, my company. It's the uh, the lack of appropriate data from my perspective in order to provide forensic, uh, say, algorithms that are suitable by forensic standards. Um, yes, so they this was not a. It was more of a theoretical work, 
And uh, this is why I'm basically right now I'm trying to find a good balance between theoretical work that's more long term and they can say, well, this is how we can come up with a, with a, a, a framework that may be more suitable to produce, a, let's say, a forensic suitable algorithm. And on the side, well, this is what we can do with conventional uh, machine learning algorithms on concrete tasks. But okay. although they show promise, I'm skeptical as to whether they should be used uh, directly without uh, without the supervision from uh, from human experts or anything. If that makes sense. Oh yeah, that makes sense for sure. Right. Um, let me ask you. So you mentioned the the other. Um... Uh, actually, most recently at Forensic Science Day at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, uh, there was, uh, I was listening to, uh, I think his name was uh, Iman Faisal. He, he was a, an intern student of yours, and he did a project with you on age assessment from uh, the hip bone. Is that correct? It was the hip bone? Yeah, it was the Oscoxa. Yes. So okay. she. <laughs> she. She. Sorry. And um, now in her project, uh, there was a previous project you had worked on, which was uh, ancestry and sex assessment on crania, right? So um, these are both working with 3D data sets. And were there any differences or it, like, can you describe in a simple way how you're applying uh, machine learning to these data sets to get uh, some kind of a, an assessment or some kind of, a, of an answer out of, out of the data sets? Um, okay, I'll try and uh, provide the simplest answer, yeah, yeah. because as you can see, it's technical. Um, so to answer your first question, basically the same basic algorithm is used, and this is PointNet, which I referred to before. So the underlying algorithm does basically um, classification on 3D point cloud data. Um, the idea is that the algorithm is basically ready-made, and all that needs to be done is basically adapted in order to take a different type of input and to provide the output that we're expecting. So again, so that was first what you mentioned regarding the um, regarding ancestral background uh, assessment. So it would be classification according to again the, the expected background of these uh, uh, of these um, of these uh, skeletal remains. And the second case, as part of uh, Amon Fessel's uh, research, that would be for age assessment. Um, what can I say? We can discuss like the type of data, for instance, what needed to be done in order to um, acquire the data. Would that be really relevant to you, Eugene? Yeah, please. So um, in this current state, the algorithm takes 3D point cloud data. So that just basically means that this is uh, the input. Think of it as an array, so a list of um, 3D coordinates in space. This is it. Uh, so meaning that this is not a mesh, the points clouds are not like um, basically joined together via edges or 2D elements, chest triangle or tetrahedrons in 3D, it's just point cloud data. Was this collected with uh, photogrammetry, laser scanner, what was used to collect the data? So as part of the first project, so that was, uh, so Jessica Lamb's, uh, sorry, Jessica Lamb's APG research, uh, she collected it using a structured light scanner. And uh, the different um, individuals uh, that she, uh, from which she uh, collected uh, data, were from various archaeological collections around the world. Okay. So that involved basically. Well, I'm not going to expand uh, on the SLS, yeah. but um, basically, uh, basically scan it from different points of view. I think the number of points of view were depended on the on the bone, on whether also since there were crania somewhere autopsied and so on. Okay. So, Lots of different parameters, but they were first uh, basically aligned using an algorithm, uh, which actually I uh, I designed just so it can be done automatically. Um, and then once uh, once aligned, so you basically had a complete uh, complete point cloud of the crania. It was then provided as an input to to PointNet. And um, the the astrological collections that were chosen were such that they were uh, modern. So just so that the, the, the 3D models are basically representative of potentially like modern individuals. And they were also identified, meaning that we knew the identity of the individuals, which was not used, but was used was the, uh, the ancestral backgrounds of the, the individuals. And so this is, given that we have these two piece, pieces, the data and the labels, this is what makes it possible to use supervised learning, as I uh, mentioned at the beginning of the, the talk. Okay. And in the second case, the uh, data was, uh, so it was used by Eamon Faisal, but it was also collected by uh, Jessica Lamb. And this was uh, using photogrammetry. I see. Okay. And it's, it's possible as long as you have a three point cloud data. And um, although even, even if an algorithm is trained, for instance, on SLS acquired data, it can still be used on, let's say, photogrammetry acquired data. Okay. And by SLS, just so people know, you mean a structured SLS. light scanner. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. As okay. long as you have a point cloud, that's fine. So then how does it treat the the data? It's it's a it's a matrix of points. It's a series of of points. So how how is it looking at that 
and turning it into something meaningful, I guess. So um, I'm not going to be, delve into the details of what operations actually does. Um, I would say that the general premise of PointNet, and it was a bit of a seminal article because I don't think there was really a precedent in terms of uh, machine learning algorithms that take uh, point cloud data as input. But the idea is that it's a neural network. So it's based upon, uh, based upon the, the initial premise that I mentioned, which is uh, basically matrix multiplications. And again, like other more complex operations based on that, the fact we have algorithms based on parameters. And the fact that they came up with, with basically, at least this is the way I understand it, um, structures for neural networks that are such that they have good properties. This is why they can be applied to, uh, to point cloud data. So what do I mean by good properties? Well, for instance, um, they're basically what we call permutation invariant, meaning that if you, again, like think of your, um, of your input as an either matrix or an array of, uh, of uh, point cloud data, if you swap two points in that order, like as a human being, you would not see any difference between those two point clouds because the order within the list does not matter. Well, these algorithms, for instance, they, they have this invariance property, meaning that uh, they're not going to provide a different assessment based on the order in which the, the points are provided, whereas other algorithms may. Which, which is why I think that that kind of gives a, a justification as to why like, wait, technically we can apply machine learning algorithms to many different types of data. Then we need them to have given properties that may be hard to achieve in order for them to make sense given a given type of input data. Okay, well, interesting. Um, so we talked about uh, the application of AI or machine learning to fingerprints. We talked about um, you know, the, the anthropology, anthropology, let's say, forensic anthropology and looking at age and sex assessment. Um, there's actually a question here. Uh, I'm going to bring this up and yeah. let's talk, let's talk about maybe some other areas. Um, Etienne, how can machine learning be applied to ballistics, cartridge case comparisons and things like that? Um, I think it's a fair question. We're talking about some mm -hmm. other areas. Um, it, how hard is it to adapt AI to these other areas? It just depends on the, well, it depends on your expectations regarding the algorithm. So again, there's that, uh, that debate that I hinted on regarding algorithm to be court admissible. Again, we, we really need to take that with a grain of salt. And in my opinion, there really needs to be an interaction with human expertise. But in any case, um, if we want to apply conventional machine, well, conventional, state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms, then um, it's definitely possible within a small amount of time, potentially. So for ballistics, if we consider, for instance, if we consider as input, let's say the, uh, the point cloud data pertaining to uh, the, the cartridge cases. And we potentially, let's assume again that we have a database of uh, different point clouds corresponding from cartridge cases of, I guess, different calibers, five from different firearms. I'm a bit out of my <laughs> field of expertise here, so I'm not sure which parameters are going to be relevant. But what matters is that if we have a, data, a database that is going to encompass data, which is a representative of that um, in, of the environment in which we are thinking of applying the uh, the algorithm, so again different calibers, different different parameters that need to be identified, then uh, we can definitely apply, for instance, point net to that. We could uh, potentially like formalize uh, formalize this as a classification problem, depending on on the type of assessment that uh, that needs to be done. So, for instance. Uh, you tell me if you if you have any uh, knowledge regarding um, bal uh, forensic ballistics, what would be a type of assess assessment that's uh, that's uh, that's relevant for this? Potentially the weapon from which it's been fired, or the type of weapon, or the. Well, mate? you'd have to know. I, I mean, I imagine you'd have to know as much as possible about the the, the type of ammunition, the 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 caliber, the manufacturer, mm -hmm. the you know everything else, the type of gun, the the make, the model. You know, all there's a whole bunch of different uh, details well, here. It, it's definitely possible. I would say just the, the narrower you want that category, that uh, final classification to be, the more data you need in order to back up that claim. That, that's basically it. So at first, it would be wise to just focus on very uh, large assessments, such as you know, the, the caliber or uh, perhaps the manufacturer, provided, again, that the manufacturer of the firearm has a visible impact on the resulting uh, uh, 3D point cloud of the uh, you know ejected cartridge. Yeah, yeah, so again, sure. that's, a lot, that's a lot of assumptions. But again, provided the sufficient data, then for instance, it would be possible to uh, to uh, to um, use PointNet for that. But for instance, we could use different types of data. We can just use photographs and uh, apply other types of machine learning algorithms on this, like uh, convolutional neural networks. It just depends on you know, what we think, what kind of input data we also think contains the most information about the uh, the about the evidence. And I would say in this case, it's pretty clear it's 3D point cloud. But uh, I could stand corrected, perhaps. Uh, 
perhaps um, you know experts will, will will say that this is not the case. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, a few times now about the the data and that you have to you know you have to teach or you have to have a good size. Uh, da- well, can you talk to the importance of the size of the the training? set of images or point clouds or, or the database that you have. What can you tell me about the importance there? Well, the, let's say that the, the, the strength of these algorithms, which I mentioned first and foremost, is the fact that they learn from data. That's what makes the strength. This is why they, they basically shine in, issue, in, the, in problems that are very well dealt with, uh, let's say, um, by humans, but not necessarily well dealt with by algorithms that are based on, say, theoretical knowledge of the problem. Uh, but unfortunately, that strength is also their weakness, meaning that their knowledge of the problem is really limited to the data which we give to them. So it means that it can be very tricky to think that an algorithm is reliable uh, if we only give it like very little data. So this is also why like every, every research that we're doing at the moment, we get great results, and this is why I always say, those are temporary results. They're not suitable for production use. We need more data. We need to have a back and forth as to, uh, with forensic, uh, forensic examiners, experts, as to whether the data is really representative of the ones they see in crime scenes and so on. Because otherwise, it may, it may seem like the algorithm is performing well just because, again, the knowledge of the, the field, of everything regarding, to B, uh, regarding BPA, for instance, or regarding, regarding forensic anthropology is basically within these 200, 300 images, because that's usually the size of the data sets which we're dealing with. That's insufficient. Uh, if we compare this to human experts, I'm pretty sure that they're exposed to more data than this, and they're based upon the expertise of previous people before them. This is how we know and we're able to generalize things. And this is where we have a theory of things. This is where we know to some degree when we're right and when we're not. And even then, it's hard. It's challenging. So, so yeah, we need that different requirements that need to be met in order for the databases themselves to yield algorithms that are going to be suitable for forensic use. So, and, the, yeah. yeah, I was just say. So, in the cases of, for example, like fingerprints or and uh, and uh, ballistics, like cartridge cases or bullets and things like that, there's already a, a mountain of data that has been collected. I mean, relatively speaking, yes. maybe not not maybe not in all cases. And, and well, maybe I'm wrong because there are efforts right now. Uh, through some different organizations to collect ground truth databases for these types of things, but of course, where there is an existing database, that would be that would be a no brainer, right? That would be an easy, Absolutely. easy. Okay, so but easy in areas, this result easy to get a first result and at least to show that there's promise in the, the concept of machine learning, and that then it's possible to implement upon, uh, upon this and see what are the current current limitations of algorithms. And I think that comparing uh, algorithmic and human expertise would be great on this. But as you said. This is provided that we have uh, suitable data, so in terms of quantity, but also in terms of label label information. So you mentioned ground truth because, for instance, in terms of fingerprints, we're thinking about the the source of these uh, of these uh, of these different finger marks and fingerprints. Um, the issue that I want to say is that even in in, um, in disciplines of forensic science where we have, let's say, a ton of data, it's not necessarily suitable to apply a given type of um, paradigm. And I'm thinking, for instance, of using operational meaning um, basically finger marks coming from uh, forensic cases. I'm personally against that just for uh, first proof of concepts regarding machine learning applied to fingerprint identification. Mm -hmm. And I feel that this may very well be done just because this is the the greatest source of data there is. And coming up with a a ground truth database of uh, fingerprint data is a huge endeavor. But at the same time, it's uh, like a necessary, we should start with something like this. And I don't think that this has been done in fingerprint identification, perhaps by now, yes, um, but it should be done also in other uh, forensic disciplines. Right, right. Well, you mentioned some of the problems that can happen with, uh, you know, by using machine learning and AI. So what are some of the, what are some of the limitations? What are some of the problems that somebody can run into uh, when they're trying to apply AI to a specific problem? Well, it's very simple. They may, they may just get a wrong assessment. <laughs> it's <laughs> the same as for human expertise. Uh, but uh, unlike uh, unlike an examiner where we have we, we can discuss uh, things with that person, we have a report, we can potentially understand the, the, the reason for that error, or it's not the case at the moment for machine learning algorithms. And that ties into that issue of explainability and interpretability of these algorithms. Um, as you can see, like the, the jargon that we have is fairly complex. I, I mentioned these parameters, like basically the, the structure of the neural networks and the value for these parameters is what makes them proficient at a given task. 
but trying to draw back from this, like in layman's terms, what is it that they looked at, what feature it is? Well, there's work being done at the moment, but I don't think it's uh, it's substantial enough to just say, this is why the algorithm made the decision, and this is what needs to be changed. It's more complex okay. than that. It's through the data that that training is done, and solely okay. through the data. Do you mind taking a couple of questions from some people here? Yeah, of course. Okay, here's one here. This is uh, this is Raphael. Hey, Raphael. Uh, Raphael's a regular here on, on the program. He comes up every now and then. Uh, he's asking if you could use machine learning to better predict uh, the position of a shooter by the cartridge case ejection positions, like with a prob probability density zone. Yeah, so uh, as a PDF, yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. I'm not sure if we uh, if this is necessarily... It, it, it may be possible. I'm not familiar with... Uh, again, there's a tons of different machine learning algorithms. I'm not familiar with all of them. And uh, the research advances fast. So I'm not sure, provided that there's, an, uh, there, there's like structures for neural networks or for other types of machine learning algorithms that can take as input, well, what you expect to be given as input, which I imagine would be a training set of different uh, scenes uh, with known parameters about the, the, the shooter, the caliber, and so on. And you would have the positions of different uh, cartridge cases. That would be your training set. And you expect as I put a, a, basically a probability density function. Provided that there's a category of algorithms that do this, it's possible. My first hint would be to try and apply different mathematical methods. Uh, and I'm in, um, thinking about uh, inverse problem theory, for instance, um, regarding for, for that. So I'm just saying that Machine learning may not necessarily be the best tool for everything. They may, if if there's, um, for instance, here in this case, this assessment would basically it relies on the fact that uh, on the, the the physics of the cartridge case being ejected out of the uh, out of the um, out of the uh, the firearm. So provided, it depends on whether we think that the theoretical answer will be will give a better answer than basically uh, an intuitive kind of assessment, if that makes right. sense. Yeah, and putting the boundary between both is not easy at all. Uh, but in general, I think it's a sensitive topic because given the success of machine learning, more and more people are trying to apply it to everything. And um, I, don't, I don't personally agree with that. I think that we should choose other options if possible. In this case, I would choose another option. But okay, it's potentially technically feasible. Excellent. Hey, Raphael, thank you. And actually, I don't know if you, if I, I didn't set Raphael up for this, but actually this year we, we had an intern student that did a cartridge case ejection pattern project. So we collected a bunch of data and then we looked at trying to improve on some of the estimates. So that might be something we, we could work on here because uh, I've got some data that we could, we could throw at this thing. That'd be kind of cool. I have another question from actually Gareth uh, Griffiths. Thanks for submitting the question. So Gareth is the researcher who's doing the uh, swipes versus wipes um, um, project there, but he's asking a question uh, here if you think that uh, it's possible to use AI uh, to identify the characteristics of fingerprint impressions in blood. And, and also he has a second question, which was how much data did you use for your uh, PhD fingerprint project? Yeah. So if by characteristics, uh, you mean probably depends on what we're interested in, I guess, level two, any, any information that can be used in order to make an assessment. So level two, potentially level three DL. Well, I guess it's going, it's not, you're not going to be able to, to extract more than there is in the image. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know based on images, based on uh, the quality of these uh, of these uh, images and what you can get in blood. I feel like this would be an additional uh, uh, impediment in your assessment. I mean, it would make it uh, a lot harder. And I would suggest uh, coming up with like uh, simple problem, simple problems first. But yeah, it could definitely be applied to that, uh, determining level one, level two, level three details. So for those who don't know, it would be the presence of pores and also the the um, what do you call it, the, uh, the the width of the ridge lines. That can be potentially potentially possible. It's also possible. It, it could be possible also for the algorithm to say the level of confidence that it has in determining like the presence of a given minutia or pore and so on at a given uh, at a given location. It's possible. Uh, how much data do I use for my fingerprint project? So as I say, in this way, I present this as a theoretical work. All of my efforts to uh, come up with, uh, let's say, a collaborative uh, database of uh, ground truth fingerprints have failed uh, as part of my PhD. And uh, so I used minimal data and I focused on the theoretical aspects of it, um, which means that I hope that other people find more success than me. It's definitely uh, worth an interesting. Again, it should be the stepping stone to the application of uh, machine learning to fingerprint identification in general. Yeah, which is a really interesting problem because I think that, you know, if you are going to be applying AI, um, you know, from the research or academia side, you know, we need practitioners, we need people who are in, you know, the forensics field to help 
with data collection to help providing good data to train these systems to make them better. So that's a call out to anybody that's listening that, you know, yeah. make sure you support your local uh, students and, and such that are working on these types of problems, because I think that's that's probably the biggest barrier right now uh, for, for many people. Yeah. I would say not just the data, but also the type of assessment that I expect. Because um, again, as people in academia, we, well, especially I'm speaking of myself uh, at the beginning of uh, my PhD, had little knowledge of what it is that would be interesting for them in terms of assessment and fingerprint identification, which is the final, let's say, goal, uh, the end product of an assessment is valuable, but also determining the level to detail and so on is valuable. And um, it's through that back and forth that we can determine both the out input, uh, which is necessary evil, but also the output they can get okay. something valuable out of this. Okay. So Etienne, let me, let me ask you, what, what is next for you or what kinds of things are you like working on or where would you like to go with, with uh, Clotho AI? Like, um, what can you tell us about this? Well, the, let's say the first and foremost goal that we have is trying to use AI and other rigorous tools, say mathematical tools, uh, to forensic assessments. And um, as I think now, inspired from this discussion, the first and foremost step towards this is coming up with data, suitable data for that. Um, I think, as we just mentioned, we need to have this more of a back and forth with forensic practitioners in order to uh, determine what kind of data would be suitable for that, uh, for, for the purpose of the assessments in general. How it is that we can come up with this data? Can it come from police forces? Can it come from cases, which I know is a very sensitive topic? Or can it come from academia? Or do we need um, an actual, um, you know, do we need projects or networks in place in order to regularly have basically an input and influx of data coming in in order to, per to perform these, uh, this, uh, this, tra the, this uh, research and machine learning? And on the other hand, determine the kind of assessments that are going to be uh, valuable for that. So for the past three years now, we've been trying to contact people, uh, try to explain what it is that we can uh, do, because obviously people don't necessarily know what's possible with machine learning. And truth be told, we know that it's, I know that it can, uh, can be very helpful in assessments. And I don't think that we've uh, explored all of its potential, but um, we're trying to have that discussion, trying to say, this is what it can be used right now. This is basically the shortest path to a solution because this is what uh, the police also need, right? Um, yeah, I would say it's important to uh, to try and get that conversation going, get networks in place, not just with our company, but also with universities. They do an important work um, with respect to the collection of data, with respect to the forensic expertise, in order to, to come up with better algorithms and to know the place of algorithms within human expertise, meaning how do we interact with these algorithms? Uh, do we consider that algorithms should be directly admissible in court? And what requirements do they need to meet? And so on. Right. Well, well, it's there's certainly a lot there. Yeah, there's certainly a lot there. And have you had any, I mean, are, do you partner with any um, universities? Are you, are you working with multiple different uh, people or, or yes. any? Yeah. We're trying to get that started. So we, although we're a company, we're trying to come up with products. Uh, we're heavily invested in uh, R&D. And so we're trying to have uh, partnerships with different universities. So as you can see, it uh, pops a bit below as part of uh, the website. We uh, came up uh, just a bit below, there's a description of a uh, uh, Horizon 2020 project. So oh, Horizon yeah. 2020 is a funding campaign of the uh, European Commission. And basically, well, I, this is what we did as part of last year. We contacted police forces, research institutions in various countries throughout Europe and beyond in order to, uh, in order to come up with like concrete goals in order to, 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 to have machine learning, uh, um, machine learning algorithms for different types of uh, forensic assessments, basically. So we have this going and other partnerships I'm not going to elaborate on, but uh, the, the premise is always the same. Sometimes we even get contacted by other, other also uh, universities that have, that know that they collect data, they, they have a type of assessment that they're interested in. And we're starting to see this now, they're starting to know that there's something, if they collect the data instead of just uh, organizing it poorly, like we can organize the data we can uh, have a discussion with them, determine the kind of parameters, meaning the, the, the driving forces within data, the different, uh, with this responsible for the breadth of data that they have. And then we can make assessments based on that, regardless of what it is. You know, it can be just simple data mining or it can be uh, assisted decision making like we discussed uh, today. 
That's amazing. Well, I think it's it's super intriguing, and I, I want to thank you so much for for being here. It's it, there's a lot of explanation here. It's actually a very very deep subject, and I guess when it's a uh, a new subject, there's a lot of activity on it. So you can find a lot of information and, and it's in a lot of different areas. So I really appreciate it. And I want to wish you all the best of success. I think it's fantastic that you're doing this type of work in, in forensics. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity, Eugene. All right, no problem. Hey, hang back because I'll, I'll come back to you in just a little bit, okay? All right, sounds good. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, folks. Well, uh, that does it for episode 30. And again, I just want to make a couple of uh, quick reminders that uh, the Cloud Compare course is going to be coming up. Uh, so don't forget May 4th and 5th, that's uh, that's up here. Also, don't forget about the BPA study. I've actually put that into the chat window so you can always go back and uh, and go from there. Um, next week, uh, we're hoping to get Dr. Paola Magni, and she's a senior lecturer at Murdoch University in Perth, Australia. And the topic of discussion is going to be aquatic forensics. And uh, Dr. Magni is uh, very active on social media. You'll see a lot of her stuff uh, around, and it should be a very interesting talk. That one might be pre-recorded because Perth happens to be 12 hours and I don't think I want to have her speak at two in the morning. Uh, so um, anyway, I want to say thanks to everybody. Thank you for your questions. Uh, really interesting topic and uh, we'll see you next week, which will be episode 31. Thanks everyone and we shall see you next week. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.